The mantle of rulership to individuals over the years has been both a great desire and an incredible burden. Some would even call it maddening. The trials and tribulations of being a king or queen are many, but those of being an emperor, well, they are many more to say the least. Some treat the position with the utmost care, attention and dedication, while others abuse it to the point of destruction and or become nothing but a puppet. Then there are those where madness seeped in before power could ever be the cause. A mad ruler before there was a ruler. For that is what you could say about a certain septim, whose eccentricities earned him a reputation before he became emperor. He was the King of Solitude following the defeat and death of the so-called Wolf Queen. His name, Pelagius Septim III. In 3 E82, Emperor Pelagius Septim II inherited a debt-ridden throne of the Empire. It came with a staggering bill thanks to his father, Uriel II. By the end of Pelagius' reign, Tamriel, the empire had returned to prosperity, though as has been reported, by questionable means. When Pelagius II died in 3 E99, his eldest son, the womanizing Antiochus, took the ruby throne. When Antiochus died, his daughter, Kintyra II, became empress of the Septim Empire, and not long after her coronation, the sibling rivalry of the remaining children of Pelagius II threw the empire into chaos, an event known as the War of the Red Diamond. This war pitted Kintyra along with her uncles, Sepphoris I and his brother, Magnus Septim, against their nephew and sister, Uriel III, and the infamous Wolf Queen of Solitude, Patima Septim. Two years before this war began, however, in 3 E 119, Magnus Septim, who was at the time the King of Wearest in High Rock, had a child, a son whom he called Thoris Pelagius Septim. Named Pelagius after his father and late emperor, and would later be commonly known as Pelagius III and Pelagius the Mad. There are two accounts that differ when it comes to not only the birthday of this child, but also his mother. The madness of Pelagius records the prince as being born in 3 E 119, and whose mother was Queen Euthela of the Dureni clan, a powerful aristocratic Altma family that once ruled a vast portion of land in High Rock. The eight volume Wolf Queen series, on the other hand, states that Pelagius was born during the War of the Red Diamond in 3 E 125, and that his mother was actually Queen Helena of Lilmoth, who apparently represented imperial interests in Black Marsh at the time. Later, Magnus would have a daughter, Princess Jaletha. Again, it isn't clear who her mother was, Euthela or Helena. Though if Euthela was the mother to Magnus's children, then according to popular belief, Pelagius and his sister would be half Imperial, half Altma, with the two taking an Altma appearance. Regardless of birthday and rightful mother, assuming King Magnus had more than one wife, it can be said for certain that around this time, Thoris Pelagius Septim was born. As a young prince of Weirest, Thoris was apparently in a prime part of his family, for while Antiochus ruled the empire, Weirest had been subjected to the preference of the Emperor, as Magnus was his favourite brother. Although, if the popular Wolf Queen books are to be believed, then the Prince wouldn't have even been born before his uncle Antiochus died. Emperor Antiochus Septim passed away around 3 E 120, after lapsing into a coma. Whether or not Thoris was born on or after 3 E 119, it can be said that his early years following the death of his uncle were accompanied by chaos and ruin that surrounded him thanks to the civil war between his father and uncle Sepphoris and his aunt Patima along with her son, Uriel III. When Antiochus died, 
His daughter and Pelagius' cousin, Kintyra II, became Empress of Tamriel. This infuriated the ambitious Patima Septim, who wanted her son to be Emperor, not just the King in Skyrim. Together, they went to war with Kintyra and the rest of their family. Merely a year after Kintyra's coronation, she marched into High Rock, hoping to battle Patima and bring a swift end to the uprising. However, the shrewdness and wealth of the Wolf Queen supposedly caused one of Kintyra's allies, the Duke of Glenpoint, to betray his Empress. Thus, on the green fields of High Rock, her force was quietly murdered, and she imprisoned for the remainder of her life. Kintyra II was executed in High Rock, a death which shook Tamriel and caused many of the Wolf Queen's allies to abandon her and join her two opposing brothers, despite there being no evidence that Patima was behind the Empress's mysterious death, however likely. Patima's son, Uriel, proclaimed himself Emperor upon marching in the Imperial City, and his coronation marked the beginning of the War of the Red Diamond. Throughout this event, Pelagius' homeland of High Rock was subjected to some of the bloodiest battles of the war, and because of Magnus' alliance with his brother Sepphoris, the wrath of Uriel III and his mother was brought down on Weirest. As a result, Pelagius, his siblings, and his mother, believed to be Euthelia in this case, fled to the Isle of Balfyra, the largest island region in the Iliac Bay, and the home of the possibly oldest building in Tamriel, the Dereni Tower, or as it is commonly known, the Adamantine Tower. Supposedly, even to this day, Euthela's family house is located on that ancient isle. There are a decent amount of written records regarding Pelagius' childhood on the island, or as far as some sources state. Those who met him described him as a good-looking, personable and active young boy, who took an interest in sports, magic and music. The future for Thoris looked bright, and people considered him to be a blessing to the Septim dynasty and its future. Although, it turned out there wouldn't be much of a favourable future for the young Pelagius. In 3E127, the now Emperor Uriel III and Pelagius' uncle Sepphoris met in Hammerfell. There, the Battle of Ichidag took place a battle which resulted in Uriel's forces being defeated and him captured. Unfortunately, while the Emperor was transported to the Imperial City for a trial, his prison carriage was surrounded by an angry mob that burned Uriel alive within it, more or less ending the War of the Red Diamond, at least officially. Sepphoris proceeded to the heart of the Empire and proclaimed himself Emperor Sepphoris Septim I. Meanwhile, to the north in Skyrim, Queen Patima was battling with Pelagius' father, King Magnus, in the Battle of Falkenstein. It finished as a glorious victory for the Wolf Queen. However, upon hearing the news her son was dead and Sepphoris now Emperor, she quickly descended into a terrible mad fury. Following her son's death, Patima retreated to her kingdom of solitude as one by one, her allies began to abandon her. Despite the defeat, Magnus continued on fighting in Skyrim, likely with support from his brother. For around a decade, their sister held out against their attacks, even launching some of her own, though not necessarily with human support, or rather, aid from the living. As the Queen's rage grew, so too did her madness. As a talented conjurer and dabbler in necromancy, she summoned various Daedra and raised the dead to attack her brother's empire. It is written that her servants were nothing but shambling corpses and skeletons, her generals were vampires, and that solitude became a land of death, and that many of Patima's subjects fled, terrified of her power. Eventually, in 3E137, Solitude was liberated, and Patima defeated, though she died not from battle or execution, but simply age. If the madness of Pelagius is to be believed, the Siege of Solitude was his first battle at the age of 18. The Wolf Queen series, however, 
states that he was but a prince of twelve who watched his father finally defeat his elder sister. Supposedly, Pelagius came into contact with an old woman who may have been the one and only Patima Septi. When Pelagius entered Solitude's Mages Guild looking for a present for his uncle Sepphoris, this old woman apparently gave to him a cheap ring of fire resistance for his uncle, claiming it actually gave the wearer the ability to levitate. She also supposedly gave him a personal gift, a bright yellow soul gem infused with the soul of a great werewolf. The beast in question threatened the city of Camlon in High Rock in the early years of the Third Era. It was the werewolf that was defeated and trapped by Pelagius Septim II and his wife Quintilla, or as other sources name her, Kizara. According to legend, the soul gem once gave its wearer the power to charm others, but the old woman had that spell removed and replaced with a curse that slowly drained the wearer's wisdom until he or she lost all reason. It's said she also informed young Pelagius of his future, that he would become emperor, and one who would be remembered for many years to come. Once the old woman left the guild, she ventured through a secret passage leading to Castle Solitude and the bedroom of Queen Patima, the room where it is said she laid upon her bed and died, grinning as she took her last breath. Regardless of whether or not this is true, upon Patima's defeat, Pelagius was named the Head of Solitude, and eventually its new king. But, it wouldn't be long before Pelagius started to earn himself a title that would stick with him even in death forevermore. When Pelagius was king, his eccentric nature began to be noticed, or perhaps simply began. He is said to have been Emperor Sepphoris' favourite nephew, Thus no one ever dared pass critical comment about the king. For the first two years of his reign, his alarming shifts in weight were noted. Four months after becoming king, a diplomat from Ebenhart in Morrowind came to visit and described the king as a hale and hearty soul with a heart so big it widens his waist. Five months later, a princess of Firsthold, the capital of Oridon in the Somerset Isle, wrote to her brother, The king gripped my hand, and it felt like I was being clutched by a skeleton. Pelagius is greatly emaciated indeed. The War of the Red Diamond had taken a heavy toll on the two remaining brothers of Patima Septi. Sepphoris I died after falling from his horse, just three years following the Siege of Solitude. As Sepphoris died childless, Magnus left the throne of Weirest to take up the mantle of Emperor of Tamriel, but because Magnus was elderly and weary from almost two decades of fighting, and because Pelagius was his eldest child, much of Tamriel's attention turned to him, as it was speculated it wouldn't be long before the young king would be Emperor. The only problem was that by this time, Pelagius's unusual behaviour was becoming infamous. There are a good number of accounts regarding Pelagius' time as King of Solitude, though many are legend and few actually exist. One known case is when the king locked young princes and princesses of Silvernar in his room. He only released them when an unsigned declaration of war was slipped under the door. Another case is when he was giving a speech at a local festival. He tore off his clothes and it was apparently after that his advisers began to watch him more carefully. Thanks to his father, Pelagius was married to a beautiful heiress of an incredibly old Dunman noble family. Her name was Kataraya Raathin. Her family hailed from Ebenhart and the clan's business was mining, once a part of House Mora, but eventually merged with House Lalu. Though the Dark Elves have never been popular in Skyrim to say the least, especially when it comes to Nordic kings marrying a Dunma. According to most scholars, this marriage had two very good reasons for its existence. Magnus was seeking to cement relations with Ebenhart because the city had aided Patima and her son during the War of the Red Diamond, whereas Ebenhart's neighbour, Mornhold, had lent much support to the Empire since its establishment by Tiber Septim. 
Also, Queen Barenzia had apparently won many battles in the civil war on the side of Sepphoris and Magnus. The other reason is said to have been more personal. Pelagius's mind was continuously deteriorating, his madness becoming a problem for the Empire. It is written that Kataraya possessed excellent diplomatic skills, and that if anyone or anything was capable of keeping the king's madness contained, it was her. She would prove to be more valuable to the Empire than originally thought, for she would become the real power behind the Ruby Throne. In 3E145, e after only a five-year reign, Emperor Magnus Septim died in his sleep, though legend puts blame on his son. Some say that Pelagius was guilty of patricide, but this is often claimed to be false as the young king rarely visited the imperial city and was at the time reported to have been in solitude. Being the eldest child, Pelagius and his wife relocated to Cyrodiil, where he would become Emperor Pelagius Septim III, his wife becoming Empress Cataraya. His sister Jolethe took his place in solitude as its new queen and it has been said that during the new emperor's coronation, he fainted upon the crown being placed on his head, but Kataraya held him up so that to those only in close vicinity of the thrones knew what was happening. Though a number of stories regarding Pelagius III are greatly questioned and cannot be verified, this one in particular seems to be noted for its lack of verification. Though he was emperor, Pelagius hardly ever held much power when it came to governing the Empire. His condition caused his wife and the Elder Council to take matters into their own hands, including keeping Pelagius from embarrassing the Imperial government. Although, there are a few tales where his mental affliction damaged relations and embarrassed those close to him. One such story is when the Argonian ambassador from Black Rose in Black Marsh came to the Imperial court. The Emperor apparently insisted on speaking in grunts and squeaks, as if that were the Argonian's native language. Other tales include him embarrassing diplomats, offending his vassal kings, and supposedly brought an end to a grand imperial ball by attempting to hang himself. Pelagius eventually became obsessed with cleanliness, and it is written that many guests were woken to the sound of an early morning scrubdown of the imperial palace. There's a specific legend that tells us of Pelagius defecating on the floor after inspecting the servants' work just to give them something to do, though this is noted to have been unlikely. However, it's possible that many tales including this of the Emperor's unusual behaviour were altered, hidden or deemed as fabrications by the Imperial government to save themselves of embarrassment and hide a piece of history they'd wish to be forgotten. Pelagius III continued to reside at White Gold Tower until his behaviour became too much. He began to bite and attack visitors to the palace. It was then it was decided to send him to a private asylum, and Kataraya was finally given regency of Tamriel. The madness of Pelagius had now cost him the ruby throne. Shortly after his departure, Kataraya became pregnant with their first and only child a boy named Cassander Septim. For six years, Pelagius stayed in a series of institutions and asylums, and there were many rumours and conspiracies floating around about him being sane, and that the imperial government kept trying to find ways to keep him locked away. One account, the Asylum Ball, places him at an asylum in Torval, the capital city of elsewhere. He apparently moved there from an institution in Valenwood, Surprisingly, bearing in mind Pelagius was completely mad at this point, it is reported that he was well behaved in Torval. There he supposedly planned a ball, and when rumours spread of the Emperor's desire, word reached his wife in the Imperial City. Wanting to make her husband happy, she sent a caravan of gold to the asylum, and when the Emperor picked a date, preparations began immediately. Cooks and servants were hired, 
musicians reserved, new rugs and decorations bought and placed, and an ever-changing exclusive guest list was compiled with the help of Pelagius' advisors who informed him of who was alive, who was dead, and who was imaginary. The asylum wing that Pelagius had all to himself was transformed into a rich palace-like home. The ball was set to start at nine o'clock in the evening, and the emperor took his seat in a throne he'd ordered. By half past nine, madness started to appear in his eyes, as no one had yet turned up. His royal advisor apparently said to him, your terrible majesty surely knows that it is not fashionable to arrive at any ball for at least an hour after the desired time, yes? The emperor's response was nothing but a stare. An hour later, he called for some food and wine, and sat there eating while staring at the open door. At 11 o'clock, he ordered the orchestra to begin playing for him and the empty candlelit ballroom. By one o'clock in the morning, Pelagius retired for the evening, and halfway to his room, he threw himself on the floor, screaming and laughing in hysteria, acting out as if he was all the revelers at his party that never even began. It's written that two days later he was still in an undesirable state. He had managed to cut himself and those who tried to grab him with the diamonds on his robes. Before long, he was sent to a more secure asylum in Black Marsh. Sometime after that, he ended up in a private asylum on the small island of Bettany in the Iliac Bay. The asylum was Pelagius' personal hospital, and it was a temple of Kinnereth, the goddess of the heavens, winds, elements, and the unseen spirits of the air. On a warm night in 3E 153, after a brief fever, Emperor Pelagius Septim III died in his cell there at the age of 34, or 28 depending on which date you believe Pelagius was born, though much of the evidence points to it likely being he was born in 3E 119. It's been said by a certain powerful being that on his deathbed, Pelagius outlawed death. The second of sun's dawn is celebrated as Mad Pelagius Day, a day in which foolishness of all sorts is encouraged. His wife, Regent Cataraya, ruled the empire for another 47 years until her death during a short skirmish in Black Marsh in 3E200. Her reign is remembered as a happy one, though she was apparently uncomfortable in the imperial capital and often travelled throughout the empire like no ruler had ever done since the days of Tiber Septims. She managed to repair much of the damage done by her mad husband and other events prior to her rule. She and her imperial consort, Galliver Lariat, grew close and eventually had a son together, Uriel Lariat, who ended up ruling Wearest. Upon Cataraya's death, her and Pelagius' son Cassander took the title of Emperor. He adopted his half-brother Uriel, who then became next in line for the throne. Unfortunately, after just two years, Cassander died, and the throne went to his half-brother, who would become Emperor Uriel Septim IV. With the death of Pelagius Septim III, the Temple of Kinnereth on Bethany was destroyed, but it would be rebuilt in a place unlike Tamriel, a place that wasn't even in the same plane of existence. I suppose an introduction is in order. Not long after Pelagius' death and the destruction of the temple he died in, a group of heretics took the stones of the ruined structure and rebuilt the temple in almost exact detail. The heretics were known as the Apostles of Light and were led by a woman called Serta. They were inhabitants of the Shivering Isles, and it was there they rebuilt Pelagius' temple and renamed it the Howling Horns possibly after the legend that one can still hear the screams of the late emperor. You could say it was a fitting place for the last residence of the Mad Pelagius, as the Shivering Isles, also known as the Madhouse, is the Daedric realm of Sheagoreth, the Daedric Prince of Madness. In 3E 433, around the time of the Oblivion Crisis, 
A portal to the Shivering Isles had opened in the centre of the Nibbon Bay in Cyrodiil. Sheogorath sought to attract a champion to venture into his realm and stop the Grey March, an event in which Jigalag, the Daedric Prince of Order, destroys the Shivering Isles, so that Sheogorath must rebuild it. The twist in that tale was that Jigalag and Sheogorath were one and the same. The portal attracted none other than the champion of Cyrodiil. While questing in the Mad God's realm, they happened upon the Howling Halls, and there they found, for reasons the sane of the world could not possibly fathom, the pelvis of Pelagius III. It would later find its way thanks to the champion in the Museum of Oddities in New Sheoth, the capital of the Isle. Sheogorath has often been labelled as the cause of Pelagius' madness, for one reason or another. The discovery of his pelvis in the Shivering Isles could be evidence of this, as well as the story Wabajak, which remarkably tells the tale of a new king of solitude who lost his mind after summoning the Mad God by accident. They say you never know what goes on behind closed doors. It could be that Pelagius was a believer in Sheogorath, or did indeed somehow, somewhere, cross paths with the Daedric Prince. Those who deal with the Prince of Madness tend to lose a piece, or a lot, or even all of their minds. Perhaps those who become insane naturally belong or are connected to Sheogorath. The next part of Pelagius' story could be seen as a strong indication of that. Even though Pelagius died, his story doesn't end on his deathbed. Over 200 years following the Oblivion Crisis, the names Sheogorath and Pelagius Septim would be heard together once again. In 4E201, the year the dragons returned and civil war engulfed Skyrim, in solitude, the last dragonborn was wandering the streets of the elevated city, when a Bosma beggar named Dervanin gave to the Dover king the hip bone of Pelagius, and asked them to find his master in the Blue Palace and convince him to return home. Little did the Dragonborn know, Dervanin was once the High Priest of Mania, a region in the Shivering Isles. The beggar tricked the adventurer into entering the very mind of Pelagius the Mad via the hip bone and Pelagius wing of the Blue Palace. Upon being transported into the late Emperor's mind, there the Doverkin found a tea party. Sat at the table was two participants, the one and only Mad God, and opposite, was a grumbling Pelagius himself. Sheogorath had taken a break in the mind of Pelagius and tried to cheer him up, but the Mad Emperor was having none of it, and so the tea party was quickly brought to an end. The Daedric Prince agreed to the Doverkin's request to finish his holiday, but on one condition, that they find the way out, which was by helping the long-dead Pelagius rest easier by treating his mentally disordered mind. The way to do that was by using a completely unpredictable Daedric artifact known as the Wabajak. Using this staff, the Doverkin cleansed Pelagius' mind of his paranoia he had had since his earliest years. They also cleansed him of the nightmares he had suffered from all his life, and finally sorted out his self-loathing and anger issues. As far as Sheogorath was concerned, Pelagius the Mad was now simply boringly sane. Dead, but sane. The Mad God along with Dervanin left Pelagius' mind and went back to the Shivering Isle, and the Doverkin returned to the Blue Palace, and Pelagius himself, well, perhaps he now rests in peace. If Pelagius III's mind is truly free from most if not all madness, then it brings forward the question of why Sheogorath treated one as mad as he, as madness is the prince's forte. Could it be that Sheogorath was the cause and somehow felt guilty? Could it be that the story of Patima Septim and her meeting of young Pelagius in solitude is true, and that Sheogorath took pity? Perhaps there's truth to the legend that the Wolf Queen's madness was so strong it seeped into the walls of her castle solitude and passed on to the one who ruled after her. Whatever the origins of the madness of Pelagius, for whatever reason Sheogorath had for treating it, 
even though Pelagius may finally be of a sound mind, he will probably always be remembered as Pelagius the Mad, the insane emperor. Thus, one of the most undesirable emperors of the Septim dynasty became one of the most famous, showing us that obtaining fame and being remembered throughout history doesn't come from doing good or even bad, but from doing or being the memorable, for better or worse. Like being the Lord of Cheese, or creating the fish stick, it's a very delicate state of mind. Thank you.